I mean, if there's one instance I always feel like is super important to, to cut the track up is if there's an emotional arc in the story, I mean, the track should follow that same emotional arc. And, and often where the edit hits and where that arc hits in the track are not the same. So using the loops or even taking the full track and kind of cutting it up, moving it to the front to kind of pad the beginning till you hit that big pivotal moment is, is super important. And that's where it gives you impact. Otherwise, the, the whole story is going to kind of feel off if the music doesn't match the action. From Toronto, Phantom Media presents the Not So Corporate Podcast. Hello, hello, it's Mark Drager, and I'm the host of the Not So Corporate Podcast. And today I'm joined with Leah Earl. Howdy. And Roland H. Avaria. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha. Uh, we are here in the studio because today we have a very special episode. Uh, we have <laughs> Danny Greer from premiumbeat.com. Now, for those who know Premium Beat, you know that it's a, it's a stock music site where you can go and license music for a pretty affordable rate, and they do some pretty good stuff. For those who, of you who don't know what Premium Beat is, it's a stock music site where you can go and license <laughs> good music, and, uh, and it's pretty affordable and easy to use. We have them on the podcast this week because we wanted to talk talk about the, the the topic of stock music. It's something that has really changed over the last few years and and you know most most people on on the client side think that it's a really easy process, something that's super super simple to find. People on the production side know the challenges that we face as producers to source good music, to license the music, to hold the license and keep the license of the music in an affordable way and then be able to cut it into your piece. So I'm really looking forward to speaking to Danny about that in a second. Uh, but stay with us because after our conversation with Danny we go through our catch-up time and we talk about a few topics what do we what do we hit leah we hit you i can't tell you yet there are surprises that i the, don't think you'll like <laughs> okay so stay with us for after the interview where we talk about stuff you're not gonna like no i think our guests will like it i think you personally won't like oh, it Mark. oh good okay great anyway <laughs> here comes danny So we're joined with Danny Greer, and he is with premiumbeat.com as well, as most people know from the watermark. And he's the senior marketing manager over there. And we wanted to have him on the line because, as I mentioned, we wanted to catch up and talk with him about the world of stock, stock music, how it impacts productions, and just see how things are changing. You know, when, when I started my career, uh, let's go back 10 years now, music music sucked. And, and we used to have to buy either um, uh, memberships or we used to buy, I used to buy these, these collections of CDs and you would buy the rights to the collection oh, yeah. of CDs and you would sit there and try and listen to sound bites and pull stuff off um, and it was terrible so so for producers who are new to our world um, and you know what it's probably worse in the 80s and 90s but producers who are new to our world they, they may not even realize how awesome things are with with the ability to go through these tracks listen to stuff license it for a great price and so I was super excited to be able to connect with Danny and have you on so so Danny thanks so much for joining us no, thanks, Mark. It's good to be with you guys. And and so is that you know I, I don't know how to, personally I don't know how long you've been you've been in this world or connected to this, but but are you have you been around as long as I have where you've seen this sudden shift where music is 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 actually good? It doesn't sound stocky, and and we're able to we're able to find a lot of music like really quickly. It's it's you know it's something we may take for granted, but but it's actually something that's amazing. I think. Yeah, for sure, Mark. I mean, I actually came from a video editing background. So I was a video editor for five years and worked in the production business and did a lot of corporate videos and commercials and that kind of thing. And back then, this was, um, you know, mid 2000s, I guess, um, when I was really in the thick of it. And back then, things were starting to change a little bit. I was actually a premium beat customer before I ever came on and worked for premium beat. But um, back then, you know, I, similar to you, I had experience, you know, getting the CDs shipped to us and have to kind of download all the tracks to in your internal hard drive. And then you had to keep track of what you were licensing and, or, you know, what you were using. And then you would have to basically fill out like a license request for that. And it was a long and labor intensive process. So that is, you know, premium beat was kind of born out of the need for a better alternative, which is uh, kind of on demand. Uh, we call it like a la carte, uh, music licensing, where you can get the track you need for the project you need it right then online, and it just a lot more simple and a lot more streamlined process for sure. And and while you're here speaking about Premium Beat, you know, and I appreciate you coming on. This isn't you know in no way like any kind of sponsorship or anything. A lot of the things we talk about um, will you know carry over potentially to to different suppliers. And and I just want to let the audience know that you know we wanted to have you on because because we 
you know, in our company, we use your service. We believe in your service and, and what you guys are doing. But, but you know, just to be above the board, it's not like you guys For are sure. paying us. Yeah, there, there are, we stuff. are not the only alternative out there. There are other online licensing libraries for certain. Fantastic. So, I mean, I think everyone in the industry knows of, um, you know, Premium Beat and what it is you guys do. What would be the sides of the business that people aren't aware of? What are, what are the, you know, what are the skeletons in the closet? <laughs> I mean, we don't really have, to be honest, we don't have a, a lot of skeletons. I think we're pretty open and transparent as far as, you know, what, you know, what you see and what's on online. I mean, that's our business and that's, and that's our and kind of what we're passionate about is providing uh, curated music. I think you know I can talk for a second about kind of what's different about Premium Beat than than some other alternatives, and, and certainly like you mentioned these these kind of more traditional libraries um, where you'd have CDs and it was it's kind of labor intensive. Um, one thing I think that kind of separates us and makes us a little unique is the fact that uh, it's all the music's curated in the library. And like I said, I was a video editor for a, a number of years, and the hardest part, and I think. Anyone who's done any video production or video editing can attest to this. But the hardest part I feel about getting music is finding the right music. So, you know, there's a lot of libraries that have 100,000 tracks or, you know, or more. And from the very beginning when Premium Beat was started, we thought we're not aiming to be the biggest library out there. We really just want to be the best library and have the best music. And that is for the ease of use for our customers, video editors, video producers, who instead of spending, you know, six, seven eight hours or days potentially even going through libraries, trying to find the right, that, that right track and sifting through a whole bunch of junk. Um, we tried to really be super uh, careful and meticulous about kind of what we accepted into the library to make that process easier for the, the customer, the end user. It's my goal that people can get on there and find a track within a couple of minutes and not hours or, or days. So I think that's one thing that kind of separates separates us. Um, other things kind of about, about our business, uh, we're based in Montreal, Canada. Um, one thing people may not know about us is we're actually part of the Shutterstock family as of recently, which you guys may be familiar with. Um, they do mostly uh, photo licensing and footage licensing, but uh, Premium Beat is now part of uh, of that family as well. So those are kind of, yeah, that's kind of like, I guess the the base of the business, but does that answer your question? Oh, for sure, it does. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And and I think that probably speaks to the next point that that I always think about when I think about stock, and it's like we work so hard to try and find whether it's for photography or footage or music or any element we're going to license. We try so hard to find stuff that isn't stocky. You know, for it's sure. like, and, and I think in photos you can see it the most. Um, and I think there was a movie last year that that played on that right with Vince Vaughn where they took stock photos and and rolled those out as like a fake campaign. Uh, but yeah, there was like the internship, I think, wasn't it? I, I think so. But yeah, like everyone, so I saw that. everyone knows that if you get a row of like multicultural people in suits all turning and smiling at the same time, oh gosh, it feels horrible. But but for some reason, some producers don't seem to also have that same cringe factor when they find music that is just like it's just like you know MIDI based. It's stocky. For sure. It's, it's yeah. weird, and yet and yet you know you guys have just. I mean, it's 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 licensed at a reasonable fee. You you, you know, as far as unless you guys are changing this, I mean, if, you know, you pay once and you have the ability to use it in multiple uh, productions and exactly. You know, and yeah, it's and just like I and it sounds good though. It sounds good and it's and it's it, it has arcs and it has you know ups and downs and you can recut it. And you, it's just it's just very usable and it doesn't sound like stock. And that's I mean, to me, that's what music should be, especially when you're when you're talking about production music and. It needs, you know, a lot of production music, I feel like, uh, doesn't have that build, doesn't have like a tra trajectory where it doesn't really go, you know, it doesn't go anywhere. And when you're trying to tell a story, which, you know, really that's what the music should be, it should be part of like your storytelling, a storytelling element it should be a, almost like a character. In, um, it should drive the story, it should drive the emotion. So when you, you know, when you get a stock track that's just just flat lines and doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't add to what you, you know, doesn't add to like the on screen action at all, for instance. Um, so that's one thing we consider when we pick tracks and, and talk to composers and musicians that we work with is, you know, trying to find tracks that kind of build and go somewhere and have some emotional arc. Um, and when you stick that underneath a piece of footage, I mean, that can make all the difference in the world of really like driving that message home, like driving that feeling home, whatever they're trying to portray on on screen so uh yeah that's that's certainly true i think that's that's something we really try to do uh with all of our tracks is consider how people are going to use them so can you tell us a little bit about the curator process like how you guys are finding really good songs again and again and maybe turning down things that are really stocky or just are bad Sure, you bet. Um, so we actually have a team uh, based up in Montreal, Canada. Their music supervision team, and what I think what I think is really cool about this particular team, it's a small team. They're like a SWAT team of 
you know, professional music finders. And they're so good at their job because they actually are all musicians. Like one is uh, an indie, kind of an indie rock background and has toured the world in, in a band. And someone, uh, one of the other people on the team is a, uh, like a competitive piano player and has won a bunch of awards for classical piano. We have someone else on the team that's kind of a singer songwriter. So they kind of have this background and they understand, you know, they understand music. They're just, they breathe music and have lived music really for their entire careers. Um, so that's a huge part of it um, when they go and they listen to music and they can really separate the good from the bad. But also what we do is we look at uh, trends in contemporary music too. So um, one example I, I guess I could use is a couple years ago, you know, dubstep kind of came onto the scene and we saw that that was happening in contemporary music. And I think traditionally the timeline between what happens in contemporary music and what happens in production music or, or stock music, if you want to call it that, is is long. I mean, you know, sometimes something can happen in contemporary, um, a new sound or a new genre can pop up in contemporary music and we won't see that in stock music for five years or something. So we try to st- instead we try to stay on top of just general trends that are out there, top 40s, the, the sounds, um, what people are listening to. And we definitely, that influences our decision when it comes to what type of music that we pick. That's kind of the process. People submit inbound all the time. We get new requests from composers all over the world to you know, license their tracks and put, include them in the library. And then we also have more recently started going outbound and reaching out to uh, independent artists all over um, and trying to identify the new upcoming talent that we think would be a good fit. And really we accept, so, I mean, less than probably 3% of the tracks that come in, we put them in the library. On your note about trying to keep the the, the music library in touch with where music is today, can can you predict when the the happy ukulele music will finally come to an end? I I don't (laughs) know if it's going to happen anytime soon. As long as I keep making... uh, Toilet paper commercials and, uh, and you know the pharmaceutical commercials. I guess I, I imagine that's going to continue. But or what's Zoe Duchanel? <laughs> Zoe Duchanel keeps making music with the ukulele. Oh, Everyone man, loves it. Just, there you go. Just, I, I know, was right? so I was so on board with it three years ago. I'm like, yeah. oh, it's just fresh and happy and it's just happy. And it's just like uh, I don't know. It's, over, it's, it's overdone at this point for certain. But yeah. there is a place. I mean, for you know, like in those instances I just mentioned, or in some type of corporate where you have kind of a really wide general audience um, like car that you have to, have to appeal to you and then you know maybe there's a place for it there but I'm with you it does get a little it does get a little tiresome yeah it's just like the, it's just like the hey ho music right they're like yeah exactly hey ho hey we're awesome we're clapping or yeah. you know like the uh, lumineers or whatever is that what yeah, you're yeah exactly. something yeah. like that I call it hey ho music but <laughs> but you know like I, I still think it's cool but there's nothing more satisfying as a producer to hear something on the radio or, or you know like I think back to when Imagine Dragons came out with Radioactive and when that first came out on iTunes it was poppy and stadium rock and interesting and I, and and I, I loved how big it was, and I went, you know, like, oh, I'm so inspired by this. What can I find of this, you know, genre to try and start dropping into stuff? And it's like, there's just nothing there because even, no, it's even, yeah, it's our goal that I mean, really, you sh- when I hear a stock, there's this happens occasionally. Yeah. Well, one of the music supervisors will send over a track and say, you have, you know, you have to listen to this, and I'll take a listen, and it's like I can't even, t- you know, I can't tell that it's production music. I mean, yeah. it sounds like something that I would listen. There are tracks on the site that. I would, you know, I have and will listen to just on my own because they're good, like they're enjoyable, and it's yeah. not. There's, there shouldn't be this distinction, like in sound between stock music, stock well, production music, and contemporary music. Really, I have, um, to, I have to say, you know, like when we were planning this podcast and we th- said, what would the feeling of the podcast be? You know, we found a track, we pulled a track. That's our theme song. You know, it's like, yeah, it's exactly. Just, it's just, it's just. Cool. Wait, the Rocky theme song what rocky theme song no the, the, soundtrack, the, the, the for soundtrack for the podcast the one that you listen oh, to every time I thought you, you edit meant this. this specific episode because we were no. listening to the rocky theme song no, earlier we, we were listening That's to bill conti earlier song. but that has nothing to do with this podcast. okay never mind no. thanks for taking us off the train leah Sorry. uh <laughs> so you, you know you said one thing in in passing a little while ago and i found it i found it interesting because it's something uh, when i'm working with junior produ- uh, editors or when you know we have interns come in or the team when they come on board and i try you know my background was in editing um so this is something that I feel is a must and important to me. Uh, I'd, I'd be interested in your thoughts, Danny, on it, though, is is it's when people get a stock song, they're almost afraid to reconstruct it. They're almost afraid to build their own cues around their own timing. And they, they, they have the song. They know it's a good song. They like the song. It has ups. It has downs. It, you know, it moves around. But they just try to construct their entire video or their entire piece around the, the stock song rather than taking the elements of the song 
and editing it down and and building their own cues, their own their own points, and, and kind of just moving stuff around. It, do, you know, do you find that that's common amongst editors, and is that something to look out for, or do you think more people are are of my mind where where you take something that's really really good and then and then customize it based on what you need? You know, I'm I'm of the same mindset as you because, you know, really there, you know, when I, when a track is two and a half minutes. It's longer. That's not to say your scene should be two and a half minutes long. It may need to be thirty seconds long if that's what if the scene merits. So, you know, one thing we've we've found, and and I always encourage um, editors to do, is to cut the track up. Um, and you know, there's different ways you can just do that in the editing application. With premium B tracks, we actually offer loop sets. There's usually ten included per track, um, somewhere in in that range, and they're usually anywhere from like five to ten seconds long. And they're just they're basically short little themes of based on the full song. So what you can do is drop those in your timeline drop a full track in your timeline and just cut use the loops use the full track kind of you know create some kind of custom composition just tailored to your project and that's something i think is super important to do and i don't think enough people do it i don't think enough people they they take the the track as it is is like it's sacred and you can't you know they think they can't modify it or maybe they feel uh intimidated to have to go in and edit it themselves but yeah i think there's tons of value in that and i would always encourage people to do that yeah that, i mean that's a great to, to be honest sense, i hadn't sure. i hadn't even considered that because what i like to do when i look at a song is is i you know i like to look for you know what's the starting what's the build up where's it going so we may take a bridge and move it up to the beginning for for you know two or three or four measures um you know a lot of times if it has a slow build we may take you know the first four bars and then cut to the next 16, you know, 16 bars later and just try to try to tighten things up. But, but having these looping sets, um, you know what? I've I've been on your site. I know you guys have them. I never even thought of that. So they were created initially for any time when there's like an indeterminate amount of time that you need the music to loop, which would be like a, you know, a flash website that you just need the music to loop indefinitely, or uh, an iPhone game, for instance. You need the music to loop indefinitely on a on like the home screen. Um, that's kind of why they were created. But we've just found over the years, and we got feedback from people that they were actually using the, the loops as kind of building blocks in conjunction with the full track to create their own custom composition. I think in a lot of cases it works really really well i mean if there's one instance i always feel like is super important to to cut the track up is if there's an emotional arc in the story i mean like we were talking about a few minutes ago the track should follow that same emotional arc and, and often where the the edit hits and where that that arc hits in the track are not the same so using the loops or even taking the full track and kind of cutting it up like you mentioned and, and moving it to the front to kind of pad the pad the beginning till you hit that big pivotal moment is, is super important and that's where it gives you impact otherwise the, the whole story is going to kind of feel off if the music doesn't match the action as good as your stuff is it's like a huge library and there's still stuff that's probably not the best how do you avoid <laughs> like if we're giving tips to editors that are on your site like how do you avoid shitty stock music? <laughs> okay, so now sure, you're, hold on. Yeah. You're going to say there is no shitty stock music, but no, but, but there, but you know, everyone knows there is honest. stuff that, like, you probably still have ukulele music on there. And <laughs> no, it's no, there's better and there's worse and, stuff, right? And it's probably not that relevant for people that want to make a cool, fast-paced video. Like, how do you avoid? Shitty for sure. Music? Yeah, I mean, so what we have a lot. We have many options on the site now, as far as uh, searching and kind of parsing through the different tracks um one one of which is just actually searching by popularity so that refreshes in real time um it tracks you know you can search by mood or genre and then from there you can kind of drill down a little deeper and look by popularity and you know typically the best tracks will will rise to the top uh, as far as popular goes we also try to keep the library fresh i mean if things are you know we we rarely kind of pull tracks out of the library but if things haven't if things have not sold or do not seem to be popular, we will, you know, we can manually push those down too. So like I said before, really our goal is to make the process, you know, as easy as possible for the end user, for the video editor who's got a client sitting in the edit with them and it's stressful and they just need to find the right track. Um, it's our, we kind of feel like it's our job to serve that best track to them. It's in our, it's advantageous for us to do that every single time. So sir, you can search by popularity. You can search by most recent. You can search by beats per minute if you have an idea of how kind of fast you want the track to be or how slow you need the track to be. Uh, and then obviously genre, composer, mood, that type of thing as well. So you said search my popularity. So one thing that I find, and I don't know if you find this, maybe it's just a side note, but I find that there are certain songs that I hear in my life over and over again. Like, I guess they get used by companies a lot because they're so popular. Do you right. Find, Sometimes do you hear yeah, them? We, have a couple, we have a couple 
tracks that have really like taken off and I've, you know there's some that also play on commercial the same commercials that are just they play all the time um but yeah really we you know we're always adding i should mention too we're always adding tracks to the library i mean every single week we put new tracks in and uh, like I said, following the newest trends, adding new com- we add new composers all the time as well. So it's our goal that there will be enough diversity that you know you wouldn't get inundated with the same track over and over and over. But there's definitely some standouts for sure that that get licensed more than others. Well, and let's let's be honest. I mean, stock is amazing production music. Like whether it's from here or somewhere else, right? You're going to find amazing production music at a really reasonable cost, and the risk of that is coming across that in competitors or in other sites. Like, I mean, the risk is everybody's using it because it's really good, mm-hmm. and if you want that quality music where it's yours, then you hire a composer and you budget. What what would a composer cost? Five, eight grand, ten grand, or you license music privately, and then you have the opportunity to not worry about that. But there's always the risk of coming across your very track that you are using being used by someone else. I yeah. mean, that's just the nature. I don't of think one, th- other people one thing notice. I should mention too, Leah is on with premium beat, the, you won't hear premium beat. And this is one reason why it's actually, I feel like it's nice. You actually maybe won't hear the same track as often because all the music on premium beat is only on premium beat. So um, there's other libraries out there that uh, will take basically non-exclusive music. All, you know, they, all the libraries kind of share the same music and license the same tracks. Um, but what, what we decided kind of long ago and, and for a couple of different reasons, um, but to just have exclusive music. So if, if we work with a composer and we put a track on our site, you can't, you won't find that track anywhere else. And really the main, I think the biggest advantage for our customer, for the end user is that then if, if they're only licensing it from premium, then they won't get in flags on YouTube or Vimeo for copyright, um, which is super useful. A lot of you know other non-exclusive libraries, you may license a track, stick it in your YouTube video and you upload it and there's going to be a copyright flag on it because there's multiple people that are licensing the same track, which okay. just leads to like confusion and, and not a really good experience for the customer and they have to fight the copyright and everything. So can I hit you with a quick fire round and I'll just hit you with some questions and you can let me know your thoughts on them? So, yeah, you bet. Perfect. So the first was we were first came across Premium Beat many, many years ago because we were looking for um, audio content that could be used on television and broadcast at an affordable cost um, and other people weren't clear about it. Unless you guys have changed your terms and conditions, my understanding is you have you know a lower fee and a higher fee but it's pretty simple if you need to license something for broadcast. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. I mean, basically, uh, most most coverage is included under our standard license, which is you pay once, you can use it in multiple videos forever, and it's a pretty low price. Awesome. Second thing, um, we've had clients come back at times and request uh, proof of licensing. And, and I mean, we've been licensing for years. So, so while we have a pretty robust system for keeping copies of licenses, <laughs> one thing I've noticed is you can go back into your system and like pull proof of license for for songs that that you guys don't even you guys don't even have um listed anymore like you're not even selling anymore but we can go back in the system and pull proof of license is is that correct that is correct awesome third thing is we know that someone on your team um reached out to us and said hey we can help you guys make your music searching more you know easier and is that is that because we license so much or is that something that's open you know you guys reach out and are willing to help uh, anyone in terms of you know sourcing the appropriate music for the project that's something we really offer to anyone. I mean, it's not this, it's not really openly advertised on the site, but if there is anything that someone needs, I mean, they can just email our, our support. And we that licensing team, that music supervision team, will help with song selection or questions about licenses or really anything. I mean, pretty quickly, too, I think that's always been a real focus of ours is to make sure that the customer is taken care of quickly. Whereas with other, you know, other sites, it seems like you're just kind of throwing an email into a void, and that's always something we have uh, kind of prided ourselves on. Fantastic. Uh, fourth thing, if you have questions regarding the, the, the service agreement or the terms and conditions of the license um, and people reach out to you with kind of, because sometimes these are written really broadly and you're not quite sure what they mean. And, and the answer I tend to get from most most stock suppliers, because everybody's different, is is like contact a lawyer. But the lawyer looks at it and they say, you know, this is so vague, it doesn't make any sense either. Um, how, how do people approach you to just say like, hey, I'm using it in this use. Is it, does it, you know, is it above the board? Am I right? Am I wrong? What are your thoughts? Do you guys have a way of handling that? We do. Yeah, it's, it's really similar to, you know, just, just contacting into our support team. They're well-versed in the music as well as all of like the licensing, any licensing restrictions, licensing questions, they can handle all that. 
Fantastic. Next thing. Uh, why do you have such an annoying watermark? Like, seriously. What? I love it. <laughs> you love the watermark? I love it, yeah. I get it in my head. I'm like, premium beats. No, not beats. We were told not beats. <laughs> oh, premium beat. Beat. That's we I mean. actually had a, uh, a customer of ours make yes. a spoof video Out a couple months ago that was like showed the, the voice behind premium beat. It was, it was a big gag. It's, it's pretty funny. If you look, if you think if you Google like voice behind premium beat. Oh, we, we saw it on your blog. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, 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 Mr. Pretty, uh, it's pretty funny. But that was, that was done years and years and years ago. I don't even know that we get more questions about that than anything else. I don't actually even know who that was, but, uh, Oh, the real one, like the real one was done years ago. So. Years ago. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was someone, I think it was someone we just, that was hired off of just kind of like a, a voice, uh, talent thing online. But, um, we get, we honestly, it is like, Notorious. We get more questions about the voiceover guy than <laughs> anything else. So that video that you mentioned is Guy Bauer Productions out of Guy Chicago. Guy Bauer Productions out they, of Chicago. They put yeah, it together. They, super funny. And and we'll put it on the podcast episode page if people want to check that out as well. Awesome. Um, but, you know, one funny story with that is, is we spend more time as producers trying to explain to people what the watermark is. And, and we've been doing this for years. And no matter what... We get, you know, we'll say, we'll say, okay, we haven't purchased, we haven't licensed the music yet. This is a temporary track. You'll hear an audio watermark. It says this in the background. It says it every six seconds to eight seconds. You know, please be aware that when we license it, the music will be, you know, that'll be taken away. We'll do the audio mix. Like, like we do everything we can to warn people about it. And the stuff we get back is like, why does it say premium meats? And we'll say, you know, like, <laughs> like no, no, that's not premium meats. Or they'll say like, that's why great. is someone speaking Japanese in the background? We got that one. <laughs> like it's yeah, not Japanese. Japanese. <laughs> we got that yeah. Sure. So it's just, it's just like, oh man, I know, I know why you guys do it. Everybody knows why you do it, but uh, that's something that is uh, a lot of work to, to try and explain to clients that it will disappear. It's an audio watermark. And I don't know why it's so hard, but uh, any tips for us on that? <laughs> I, I had the same experience when I was a video editor as well. And I think after, you know, I had the same clients and after a while they just kind of got it. But um, it definitely, it's funny. I, to me, it's so simple, you know, it's, it's a security thing for us. But uh, yeah, I guess, I guess it's just education with those guys, with those folks. Excellent. Roland, any questions? Uh, I was thinking, um, you know, how you say the value of production music or stock music. Do you think a shift have happened because of technology? People now can do music really easily at home that's actually good quality and is allowed to expand that? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, we definitely have some composers that are kind of single you know, single players that will actually play every instrument on the track and it's it's all them. We, we have other instances where they, they still do kind of a more traditional approach where they hire composers who work with kind of a studio musicians and, and bring people in and, and they compose tracks that way. So it, it really depends, but I, I think you make a valid point though, for sure. And, and I think it's really interesting. I mean, we're able to, you know, give people careers. I mean, we have composers we've worked with for years now who have started kind of really created really nice in-home studios and things just so they can work on their premium beat music. Um, and it's, that's kind of exciting. I mean, for us as a team and as a company to, you know, a lot of it's, it's hard being a musician and for us to kind of give an outlet to people and, and to artists uh, where they can make a really, you know, a good living and create a lot of really good music and share a lot of good music. And a lot of that is in just individuals for sure. And can, can I ask you a question that I know is going to be a challenge for you to answer because, because I'm going to ask you about the, the broader world, but, but sure, but you know, taking your, your marketing hat off and putting your, your video production hat on, what are your thoughts on, on, I guess the, the last few years, this movement towards indie music. So there are indie producers producing indie music and they produce it for themselves. And then, and then there are these other organizations that kind of collect these different indie people and, and you still have to, I mean, the pricing is still, you know, on the higher side and whatnot, but, for but, certain. but do you have thoughts on, on where the industry is going with, with these indie producers with producing indie music? This has happened in the last couple of years where really we've had some new players come about that are taking artists who maybe are not, you know, they're not uh, signed with Columbia or something. Most of them are not like super high end. They're, like you said, kind of independent artists. They said, here's a new revenue stream. We will license your music for uh, uh, productions, for videos, for sync, that kind of thing. Um, you know, it's interesting. I think that that type of music doesn't have necessarily as broad of an appeal as kind of what we offer. So... Um, with premium beat, you can go on the site and find old, you know, old jazz music in the style of like the 1920s and 1930s. I mean, and there's a place for that in in some projects, or uh, or bluegrass music. And there's a place for that. I, I feel like with some of like the indie rock licensing, a lot of it, you know, it's a little it's a little bit more limited in terms of what type of usage they could use that for. I mean, 
you know, you're certainly, you can't use that for uh, a, oh brother, where art thou period piece, right? So, you know, we were, whereas our library I feel like is a bit more comprehensive in, in terms of style and genre, then yeah, I think maybe more the indie rock stuff is maybe more kind of for commercial and, and film and that type of thing. And it is a bit more expensive, obviously, to license that stuff. But it's interesting. We, we're definitely keeping our eye on it and kind of seeing how that evolves over over the next couple of years. And so we're, and on that, where do you see, you know, how do you see this playing out? Where do you see the future going? Because, because we saw probably two years ago the most affordable stock music that we ever had. And, and in the last few years, what I've noticed anecdotally, um, looking across all the different stock players, uh, a movement to bring up pricing, um, obviously to eke out, you know, a little bit more money for, for the sites or maybe more marketing spend, but also maybe pass a little bit of that on more to the artists. Um, so that way they could do, you know, they could do what they're doing a little bit better. But, but we, we, you know, I, we've seen costs even within the affordable areas move up, but, but where do we see the future? How do we see this playing out? What, where, where are we going? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I can I can speak from Premium Beat in that you know in ten years we've raised our prices one time for us to pay our composers out. Um, that was important, but you know I, I think it's interesting. I I don't necessarily know you know that the that the industry as a whole is is kind of going up in pricing. I mean, there's certainly still the traditional model of music supervisors and it's real you know a traditional hollywood model of where it's very 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 expensive and that still exists where you know you're spending you want to license a, a popular track for fifty thousand dollars plus hundred thousand dollars that i think that is you know is, is going to exist far in the future um uh, as far as kind of online marketplaces like us and, and others um I, i'm not you know to be honest i'm not totally sure um i think certainly the cost of just the cost of uh living and inflation and everything will will have incremental increases but i don't see things dramatically getting more expensive for any reason in, in the near future and what are your thoughts on youtube if you go to the creator studio within youtube they have you know the selection of music that they'll allow you to use that isn't maybe something that brands or or, or more commercial producers would would be going towards but that must that must still bite at your heels a little bit eh? sure yeah and i mean there there have been um you know, there's YouTube has their own. I think Vimeo has a, 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 some tracks on there as well. I, I tend to think as anyone who is a, a brand or a company may shy away from that because, you know, we talked earlier about the overuse of particular tracks. I mean, when, when there's a track that's someone's like giving away for free, I mean, you can bet that that track will be used over and over and over and over and over again. So the fact that it is, you know, the, the, it is so kind of widespread, I don't feel like it's a big threat to our business. But um, certainly, uh, I mean, that's there. I think that's kind of there more for kind of consumers and like kind of the everyday video uploader and not necessarily like the video professional. So for producers looking for music, do you have some top tips for searching, finding great music on your site or other sites like it? Yeah, for sure. I mean, with, with Premium Beat, we have have kind of built our site for the video producer, the video editor, um, you know, we actually did a huge update back in October of last year. Um, and I know you've been longtime Premium Beat customer, so you may have noticed kind of when that shifted. Uh, and it wasn't just necessarily a look change. We actually added a bunch of features. So um, as far as finding music, uh, I, one thing I think a lot of people don't know about using our particular service is that it's all shortcut. You can actually search music using shortcuts. Did you guys know that? I didn't know. I'm, yes. I'm curious. It's actually pretty good pretty fast yeah, so, i like you know, it you just tap down the arrows and left and right and you go there you go so it's, it's kind of geared toward people that are used to really working on computers video editor specifically yeah. um it really makes kind of that process fast you know really you know as far to answer your question i mean there's there's really no kind of silver bullet to to find the perfect track i mean searching by popularity looking at uh using the the search tools for genre and mood and then we've we've kind of made, you know we've made it real easy when you check out you just basically look at we have very simple licensing. You pick the license that best corresponds to your usage and you pay with a credit card and you get the files instantaneously and then you can throw them in your project and kind of be on your way. So, um, you yeah, can replace, right? You can replace the watermark track. Sure, easy, certainly. Right? And that's what most people do, honestly. I mean, yeah. most people don't come to the site and find a track that day and just download, buy it and download it and put, you know, put it in their project. Most people use the watermark. And then we, you know, we can see this when we just look at traffic and, and we talk to folks. I mean, people will download a watermark version and then come back uh, a week later or a month later and, and buy that full 
resolution, un, you know, license track, and then they'll swap it out in their project. Yeah, and, and so so one quick tip, something sure. that I used to do back from the Final Cut days when I used to be an editor, um, is is for anyone who's downloading a watermark track, the majority of the watermark tracks you can edit to, and then if you go back and download the, the full version, and then just look at the first few frames of the full version versus the watermark track, and if there's four frames before the, the, first, the first note, or if there's eight frames, you can quickly do the math, and then in your software in your in your you know your editing software just overwrite the file and and then shift everything those four frames over those two frames over those one frame over because because as long as you have the the beginning of the track matching up, you don't have to go back in and re-edit everything. You can just do you can just basically do a replace um, with with a target like a target replace in the back end and voila, your file is updated and, and all of the cuts should be maintained and all of the beats should, should be maintained. Um, I don't know if that's something that a lot of people do, but it used to save us a lot of time to do that. I think a lot of times, like uh, in my experience, the track's exactly the same too. Like there is no... It should be. There is yeah, no pause be at the exactly beginning. The so now really? you can just straight up replace. Yeah. Oh, I think so, with so I haven't edited in a few No, years, no, obviously. but I think what you're talking about is a different service and premium beats is the service where they're identical. It should be exactly the same. Yeah. So you'll just go and replace it. And it's it's funny too how often we actually, things will act, slip through approval processes and get uploaded online uh, where people will send us emails all the time. So-and-so, you know, accidentally, you know, publish your track with or publish their video without swapping the track. So I always encourage people, you don't want to forget to go back and license yeah. the track and swap it in for the, the full so, resolution so track. Quick, quick. Quick story. Maybe we shouldn't admit this. Quick story. We, <laughs> because we, we tend to use three, four tracks per per video, and um, and we had a video that was online for three years before we realized <laughs> that that there was a watermark mixed into the background on one part of the video on one of the tracks, and we had to go back to the cl the client and say, "Are you still using this video?" Like, you know, we we obviously purchased it and and, and tried to correct our mistake, but. Um, yeah. So as a stock person, you know, it was an honest mistake on our end. We paid for it. We weren't trying to cheat you. We just we just made a mistake. And we went I think it happens client. pretty often. Well, well, how do you guys react to that? Because I guess my fear is always that that you guys will bring the hammer down. But but I also know with, you know, being a Canadian company, Canadian laws versus U.S. laws and this and that, it's it's just hard to to to, to do that. But but how do you guys handle that as an organization for people who make an honest mistake? Yeah, I mean, if someone makes an honest mistake, most of the time we'll go back to them and say, you know, you got you guys forgot to you know you forgot to replace it and then they'll license it and it's it's you know it's pretty painless. They're not going to get a uh, you know black SUVs roll roll up to their house or anything and uh, you know take take, take them? them away or anything like that. But we, we take usually them back just to try Montreal. to let, let them know so so they can just go ahead and correct it. That's cool. And so have you been up to Montreal from Texas? Because because you, you're 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 way down in Texas, huh? I am. Yeah, I'm based in Texas, and uh, some of the premium beat marketing team is down here. And then the company was actually founded. Uh, Ten years ago, up in Montreal. So I, yeah, I go up quite often. Actually, we've got our team up there is growing quite a bit, and uh, on we're we're rocking and rolling. So that's kind of the headquarters up there. That's where the majority of folks are. But I, I get to go up there a couple times a year, and then I'll I'll be up there in January this year. It looks like yeah. when it's negative. Ooh, 10 yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's our good time up in Canada. That's when we have <laughs> the best weather. <laughs> and, and Danny, are you a baseball fan? I uh, just fair weather, I guess. Oh, uh, okay. So you're not a fan of. Wait, so is Toronto fair weather baseball fans. No, but Everyone's ask, super behind it. I was going to ask if he's a fan of, of the Texas Rangers. Right. Is that you the know, team we just I, I watched them just here recently when they were doing pretty well. But, um, you know, I most time I'm not I, I don't do sports a lot. But, uh, yeah, I know the Rangers. The Rangers had a good shot at it this year, but they didn't. They couldn't uh, they keep it together. They to lost Toronto. Although now we're playing who? Kansas City? Yes. Leah, you don't even know. You're on the bandwagon. You don't even know. I'm not on the bandwagon. I haven't Kansas watched City a game single game. Already, I haven't watched any yeah, games. Yeah, it starts in a My, few minutes. But I think already did. Anyway, so I mean, I think I think to end our conversation, the biggest thing that every editor wants is they want to be able to source really, really good music. They want to be able to make sure that it's budgeted appropriately. But really, they don't want to spend hours. I mean, it takes hours and hours and hours, and then you shortlist five or six songs, and then you download them, and you work, you start to work them in the cut, and then you realize you thought they were good, and they're no good, and you go back, and you're just looking and looking and looking. I mean, as good as your service is, as good as the other services are, is there any way to overcome that, or at the end of the day, is it just just do a lot of work, find something that, that works for you, and then make the most of it from there? You know, one one thing I think, um, from my own experience as when I was a video editor, is I always found the music 
process to be a lot more simple and a lot more expedient when I would do it on my own without having a client in the room. So oh, I feel yeah. like that is one kind of just personal, I guess, anecdote or uh, suggestion that, that I would offer is that, you know, I, usually I would try to call up together four or five tracks, four or five options and present those to the client. Maybe, you know, sometimes just three. You don't want to, you know, inundate a client with with too many options. Um, but I would usually would find three that were not exactly the same either. Um, maybe, you know, kind of, they each were maybe one was a little rocky and one was a little poppy or something. Um, when they're too similar, I feel like it gets into conversations. It kind of drags out and splitting hairs. But for me, it was always working with clients and getting client approval. That was kind of the hardest part of, of finding tracks. It was that initial going through and finding them, which I hope that we've, we've kind of uh, streamlined with premium beat and made that, that process simpler, but that sometimes that wouldn't make the process with clients. When mm-hmm. clients were in the edit, it would just take forever. It would not, you know, it wouldn't, simplify that. So I would get three or four tracks, then go to the client, offer them as these are the, the three options and see, you know, go from there and kind of see what, uh, what they say. That's, that's interesting. Cause we don't, we don't even share the options with the track with the client. We pull the track that we feel is most appropriate. We put together the rough cut and we share it with them. And we say, this is the music we selected for you because we know that's the probably even better. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, we hear people and I, I know people have worked with editors who will actually sit down with the client and go through every track and listen. And it, you think, you know, the process, you think it takes long. It takes twice as long when you've got two people in there listening to every single track and, yeah. and having to kind of meticulously look at it and, and dissect it. Um, so I, I actually, I think I'm a, a bigger fan of the way you Well, until, it. You, until you see it up against pitcher too, you, you like, you think it's good, but you don't really, you don't really know. And so, and so the, the I mean, for us, I, we end up falling into that, into that cycle that you do when the client says, you know what? I like it. What else is there? And we'll say there's, you know, like a million options and we spent hours and hours and we feel this is the best for these reasons. But if you'd like us to pull some more, we can. And then, and then we start to go through the cycle of like, of like recutting and recutting and recutting and recutting. And it ends up, we end up usually, Roland, how often do we end up with the track we originally pulled? More often than not? Or? Yes, we do. Yeah. And it's an exercise in craziness insanity (laughs) insanity for sure but the best thing to do is to say we're professionals we pulled the track we did the research we know what's available we pulled it for all of these reasons it matches up to the cut this is this is like where the experts trust us or you can even hand the clients the site and say listen you can take a look around let me know your thoughts and they get so overwhelmed they don't even know what to do with it. The way I approach it too is a little bit different. You no, know, the whole conversation we had so far is an afterthought. So you go produce a video, you come back and you look for music that works for it. But if you go about it in a way when you're producing the piece, you kind of know the style, the tone that you're going with. You can start doing the song searches that you want, something that, because for me, like you mentioned really early on in the conversation, it's part of the story. It's not just something that you put in the background that it's not elevator music. It's part of the whole package. So, exactly. So if, if, if producers go out there and actually spend the time when they're planning what to do what are we going to shoot what's the pace and actually start working with the song and pieces and uh it would be good to start slow and then go fast or something like that then then it's all part of the whole process of and i think that's one of the things that most people fall into is they they think about late oh we'll figure out later on if you go through the process up front just like producing anything else it really helps and you've developed the story that's even though you didn't specifically composed a song for that piece, but you produce a piece to that song, mm-hmm. then it, it, it's, it's kind of an interesting uh, exercise. We, we do that for script writing. So we'll, we'll download one of your watermark tracks and we'll throw it into iTunes on loop. And, you know, if you're sitting there for, I mean, I don't know how long other people spend on it, but if you're sitting there for three, four hours, you know, crafting and working on a script and talking about options, just having it in the background, just, just, just knowing the tone you're going for, just reminding the pace you're going for, and everything else certainly helps in my mind with with setting setting the tone for what the piece will be. And and without that, um, it it could be a real challenge. So that's that's one of the other little things we do. And again, maybe everyone does that. I don't know, but 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 it's something we do to just help to set the tone through uh, through through script writing. I really like it. I haven't heard that before, actually. There you go. You can do a profile on us on on that. Cool. Yeah, it's very cool. (laughs) I dig it.
Okay, fantastic. So we're going to move into the catch-up time now. Uh, and Leah has a few topics for us to discuss. But before I we do. do, I just want to thank Danny Greer for joining us. Uh, if you would like to get him on Twitter, you can reach him at Danny Greer. His last name is G-R-E-E-R. Or you can hit him up on Instagram at Danny Greer. Or you can always check him out at the Premium Beats blog. So fantastic. So Leah, what do you have for us for the first topic that you want to try and see if we're interested in? So my first topic is, what would be the good first one? Okay, my first topic is yesterday was Back to the Future Day. October 20th. I don't know if you guys have seen Back to the Future today, recently. October 21st. I do know where you're going with 2015 this. 2015 is the day that was they're the supposed day to show they up. traveled to yes. in the second movie. So the big question is, did they show up in the future? Are they here? <laughs> Are they here? Are they hanging around with their flying boards, doing what they need to do? Hoverboards. They're yeah. hoverboards. Okay, so on October 21st, they're supposed to show up from the future with their flying hoverboards and everything. The question is, are they here? Well, that's that wasn't my question, but I would like to know that. Um, first question. I have a series of questions about this. First question is, I think that that trilogy of movies... Each movie is just as good as the first. What do you guys think? Um, I, 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 I have not seen them since I was like five. What? <laughs> Sorry. So Roland? I watched. I love them both. There's three. There's three, but yeah. I like the three of them. <laughs> okay. I have. So I watched. Back I like to number future. one and three. Two is kind of I don't know. Number one. When they go is, into the future. Number yes. one is the past. Mm. Number three is Wild West. Right where his yeah. like his face disappears on the wanted poster or something. Yeah. Yeah. And number two, I don't remember. Number two is where they go into the future and he finds yeah. like if his mom married Biff. Yes. I don't know who Biff so is. So good. Biff's like the, the, the tall guy. Antagonist. Antagonist. From the the blom tall dude. He's like beefy and he's like bosses the dad around. He's like, oh, sorry, <laughs> Biff. I'll go and help you out with I your can't, I dear, can't. dear He's so good. Number three is paper. awesome. I can't help you on this subject at all. All right. I was well, watching okay. actually Rick and Morty last night, which is like a Rick and Morty, Rick and Morty which is like a cartoon. Okay. Uh, you can see in Comedy Central, I think, that is based on the characters, but the, <laughs> but the scientist is drunk grandpa. He's <laughs> always drunk in the show. <laughs> it's what, all good. I this? really like this. It's idea. good. You should check it out. <laughs> is this all part of, like, you mean Comedy Central, so do you mean this is that nighttime, what's that nighttime thing? I don't know. I found it online. I mean, I what? rented it. <laughs> Oh right, right. You from the from Blockbuster or yeah, as a render Rogers from Blockbuster. <laughs> Rogers video. Blockbuster hasn't existed in years. I went there from John's video. The local it was sad. I drove by the local Blockbuster the other day. That what used to be the Blockbuster is now a rental center oh, where you yeah. can rent to own, which is just sad. Why is it sad? It's awesome. Rent to own. I feel like that's just what poor people do. Oh, right? but it's not sure. <laughs> what, what else is sad? You're really alienating our poor <laughs> listeners. <laughs> I'm sorry. I've this is not sure, wasn't it? It was, yes. and there's like five rent-to-own centers I see, I, all around I, I, there. I saw one of those on Jane and Finch there. They, was like, <laughs> oh, they so actually do exist. <laughs> did you not feel the exact same way that, that I felt then, or are we no, just being biased? Okay, so I did a little research into what they predicted the world would be like October 21st, 2015 versus our world, and it's like basically the same. Okay, so like what, what do we got? Virtual reality headsets. We have those. So what would that Hoverboards. be? Hoverboards. O- Oculus Drift. Or like Google Glass. I don't know. Okay, great. So we got them. Um, hoverboards. We have that hoverboard nope, thing. No, that's not true. Yeah, but that's they're not like... True. Nope. Nope. They could have invented it by now. They could have... They're pretty similar. Those they're like not sur- similar at all. things without the... No. That is the most retarded thing. Is it's not a real... It's not a It's even, even, the, even the quote-unquote Lexus one or whatever that was, that project yeah. that Tony Hawk did, was basically could only hover like uh, an inch off the ground. Well, so. we're getting there. Nope. Okay, FaceTime. FaceTime, we, we, we can have. do that. Yeah. yeah otherwise, um, video smart calling. Smart watches that can tell you the weather. We have those. No problem. <laughs> Who could have predicted watches. back then the internet would be around? <laughs> no one in 1985, or I guess the second movie is 1989. So um, there is no internet then that was like commonly known of that people like. There was no internet. I think I think the first time that the the mainstream hit the internet was around 90. Didn't the 94. government have the internet in like the 70s? They were just secret about it. Yeah. So. Anyway, I don't want to get into it because okay. I'm probably going to be All wrong, right. but I believe it was set up as a university network and a military network in the 60s, so that way the different universities could crunch uh, numbers and share computers. Right, right. I believe. Okay. I don't know. Roombas? Like the one that cleans the streets? Like we have Roombas now that can clean our house without us being there. They just like pour around a vacuum. you have a cat that talks it, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Hold on, do you have a Roomba? <laughs> no, but I heard of it. Oh, man. Yeah, the so, cats don't enjoy them. So when I, I was over at a friend's house, I won't say which one because you get mad at me for mentioning them every single time. Evan uh, Carmichael. Evan Carmichael? 
It, Shut of espresso. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you, you just read line there. But anyway, I was at his place. Okay, and let me do it again. Shut <laughs> of espresso. Okay, I was, I was at his place, and he had one or two, and the kids just chased it around, and, and my, my oh. little ones would try and sit on them as they drove oh. around. They pretty much destroyed his room. <laughs> so, But it wasn't only my kids. He had a party, and there were a whole bunch of kids there. So, so you were like, I wash my hands of this situation. <laughs> uh, yeah, pretty I'm not much. buying it. Okay, right last well. two ones, smart homes and 3D movies, which all exist. So smart like, home. I feel like we don't have flying cars, but we're very close to the future, predicted by Back to the Future. Excellent. That was... A fail of a topic. Still? Next. No, I liked it. I liked it. Roland, you even pass? Hold on. Me and Roland can vote. I vote okay. one thumbs down. I like it. Thumbs up. Okay, Thank there you, you go. You're split. I vote thumbs up. So no, you don't get a vote. You don't get a vote. <laughs> You're the one who brings them. No, you don't get, get a vote. I get a vote. No, you don't. Yeah. That was no. my best one. No, no. that no. broke me. That's your best one. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> okay. I wouldn't call that a best one. <laughs> oh, either. no. All right. My Lots second of editing. one is Lots it. Of editing. Um, this one is actually specifically for you because it has to do with Who's China. Roland. Okay. okay, well, so the audience so. can't see you point at him. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Leah. What? <laughs> You're like, this is for you. <laughs> yeah, who's you? You, the all audience? Right. For you, all of our Chinese for lover listeners. This is the China update, oh, really. Man, I I actually, I brought this right on now. here so that I could ask Roland, you. Our Chinese food? When was the last time we had good Chinese food? Not a long time ago. Man, my diet is killing me. Okay, go on. I had a good weigh-in, by the way, this morning. So, maybe you guys should get Chinese food <laughs> on Friday. Right Cheat day? Yeah. Um, all right, China so update. I have some questions for you because you are the China expert. Uh, sure. I heard that in China they've genetically engineered dogs to be extra muscular. Why? Um, yeah. Why? Um, because it'll make them better, like search and rescue dogs, police dogs. Like that's that's the that's what they're saying. That's why they did it. <laughs> so do you trust them? I don't know. I like I have a picture here. Do they actually last? <laughs> but our listeners like can't hear it. But it's like uh, holy it's a smokes. beefy dog. Are they actually? Okay, dog. This, this looks like okay, uh, listeners. For you guys to picture this dog. So what type of dog would you say that is? Because I'm bad with dogs. Is that a uh, whippet? Isn't that what it says there? Okay, so let's imagine a whippet. Which who, who knows is look, that a I'm, type of dog? I imagine no a dog that looks a bit like let's say a Rottweiler, even though you won't say that it does. And then imagine like um, the Rock. With his muscles. Put together. Put together. Yeah. Imagine the dog version of what The Rock Johnson looks like. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Dwayne, Dwayne the, Rock the Rock Johnson. Johnson. <laughs> Imagine a dog version <laughs> of that. And that's what these Chinese dogs look like. <laughs> yes. Huge. Did bigger they, than yeah. bigger than uh, other things on there. <laughs> so I, my question, question for you, Roland, question for me, is yes. Go what, ahead. Why, what? Why? Go ahead. Why is China up to uh, this? Next. Next. Oh, he failed it. Uh, China up because... Uh, this, this China, they need to produce more crap. What? <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't have an answer for you. That fails. All right. Done. Dead. Well, does it actually, do, do the dogs actually last and are they durable? Oh, are they durable? So many questions. Okay, Can you ask questions and give me a question? <laughs> hold on. Hold on. <laughs> let's let's, let's slide this way. Roland, you, you have two cats, right? Yes. I have a cat. Leah, do you have a cat? Yes, she yes, does. So do. none of us have a dog here, right? Leah, do you have a dog? No. Okay, so. I'm going to buy a dog one day. Are you? So here's the thing. My yes. wife really, 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 really wants to get a dog for the kids. And I you don't get do a dog not for the kids. like dogs. I don't. Why not? I, because cause I don't What's really... What's wrong about dogs? They're going to smell? They're going to poop all over your house? Yeah, so the, and, and inside everything, but and they're outside. Beautiful. And they've got hair everywhere, and they're really expensive, and they no, no, no. make what a lot of noise, <laughs> and you have to they, go they home so all the time. Yeah, they so need that way, so I already much what you do, What you yeah. do is you save your money from the vet, yeah. buy yourself a gun. Oh, oh <laughs> roll it. And you can just, no, when they get on. sick. No, because I just muted your line. Okay. I can't, I can't you know have what? you finish that People thought. People that have dogs no, who don't have kids yet treat their dogs like their kids, and they actually take just as much time. It's like our yeah. kid. We're like, we have to go home because our kid has to go to bed. They're like, we have to go home to walk our dog. We're like, To what? let the dog out, right? They're like, you have a dog. We have a baby that I like <laughs> grew for nine okay, months. Okay, well, hold so. on. Don't be too mean. Some of no, these couples, no, but like... Some of these couples may want kids and be trying for kids totally. and you're being so I'm super not, mean to them. I'm Why are you so mean? mean I hate them. those couples who are trying to stop. What? what? Roland. 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 We're going to have to cut I you out of this him. podcast. Why? Why would you say that? I was trying to be, be mean to Leah. Is that what you did? No. No. <laughs> I'm not. No, I'm saying she's oh. being mean to these couples and then you jump in and say you hate them. <laughs> Oops. Out I of context. W- <laughs> I was sticking up for the couples. Okay. okay cut I, all this. And let's no. Go back. Don't cut Sorry. this. Okay. I'm going to have to all work I'm this saying. into the opening uh, now so that way you no, have to. No. All I'm so that saying that is say. that dogs are a lot of work and it's very intimidating. Yes. As a pet owner, if you have a cat. So wh- what would you say to my wife? I what? would say if you. Jacqueline. Like Jacqueline why? Drager, you should insist until you why have you two of them. <laughs> no, no, Roland, no. that's, that's what I would say. What would you say to my wife who, wants, who has four kids and wants a dog? You need to think about getting out of bed, 
When your puppy is whining at 2 a.m., putting oh, your boots gosh. on, putting on your Put, coat. Putting your boots on? What did you become? You, you become Western go, here. <laughs> yeah, you You're have gonna to walk, walk them them poop, poopers. Put, your boots walking on. Walking them around the neighborhood and p- then picking like up their he, poop after they changed. poop. Walking them around the neighborhood. Uh, no, but that's what you need to think of when you think of okay, getting so a dog. My wife would argue and she would say, well, I love walking and it would give me an excuse to get out and exercise morning, more. when it's cold? It's the winter. In this scenario, it's the winter and it's snowing. So then you wouldn't, why wouldn't you just build a pen? Just what she say. Why wouldn't you just build a pen and then just put them in the pen? No, they can't because it's like, it's so deep and they can't get out there and they're crying because <laughs> they're just a puppy. So they need you to walk them. It happens. Next. My next one is CDs and DVDs. Yep. Is it safe to say they're extinct? No. Do you guys still have some? Because yes, wait, they I have do. limited storage capa- They have limited storage capacity. Yes, they're do. not reusable. They're expensive. They're fragile. They take up room you know, to carry them around and yes. stuff is annoying. Do you still use them? Uh, yeah. So I can't Blu-rays. recall the last time I actually popped a CD into like my car. Like I can't remember the last time I listened to a CD. But uh, yeah, I'll I'll sh- I'll borrow friends DVDs or Blu-rays mostly because Blu-rays are way better. So, so you watch movies on a DVD format? If, well, I like, like, hold on. Like, if you go like, to Walmart, like four get, times get it for a like 250 Like four times a year. My if wife we, likes to go to the library, though, as well, and and because they give you them for free. So well, you, she'll you borrow can rent stuff. Him, borrow um, you have to get a library card and, like, give Which them ID. Free, so. That's not free. What you, why isn't that free? It's free monetarily, but. Yeah, my, my property tax supports the library, and okay. then the library buys the DVDs, and then they give them to you for free. So you and s- CDs if, if you want, but I don't. Again, who goes to the library to borrow a CD unless yeah. you're going to just rip it, right? Yeah, well, I used be honest. to do it. My used to rip it? it. Yeah. When I was in high school. <laughs> oh, yeah. Stop at the library, grab a whole bunch of DVDs and a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so when I was. Ribbon. What other <laughs> stuff are you grabbing at the library? When I was a kid. Drugs? When I was a kid, stuff. we used library to. Library drugs? Um, we used stuff. to rent VHS tapes from the library. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We used yeah. to rent VHS from Blockbuster. From Blockbuster. Yeah, because they were cheaper than DVDs. Yeah. They were like only yeah. like two bucks. So you go again, or like Jumbo six, video. and you get the seventh for free. Jumbo video. Yeah, do, you remember, do you remember Video 99? Do you yes. guys ever remember Video 99? No. Yes. They used to, that's that's where I used to rent all my stuff from. Oh, we 99. used to go to Jumbo Video and they had like a haunted castle part at the back and I always wanted to go in there and my dad was like, you can't go in there. And then oh, one the day I went in there. Oh, the haunted castle part because it was a porn It was stuff? a porn part and I didn't know. <laughs> 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 the haunted castle. I w- no, it literally looked like uh, it looked like the cover of a DVD from like that same era, it, like oh. the and early, what the was late eighties. It? <laughs> it was all. It was like where they kept all the porn. Like oh, there was just snap. porn shelves, but it had like a haunted sort of castle opening, probably to discourage children from going oh, in. Oh gosh, it's terrible. So you want to hear a story? So so when in the library, the library that we used to go to, if you remembered the last four, the last four digits of of the of your phone number. And you knew the person's name, so last four digits and the person's name. You could sign stuff out without a library card. What? Uh, what? Whatever. It was in the country, so you could sign stuff out without a library card. And then, um, and then, if you kept it for more than three days, you'd have to start paying. I had a friend who knew someone else's phone number and their name, so they just walked up and they. I think they got showgirls or something, but they were like under eighteen, so so in grade nine or ten. So they get showgirls under someone else's name, with their library card, and then doesn't return it so it's racking up fees <laughs> so that way the person's because they were a kid was tied to their parents account so when the parents come into the library <laughs> library to say to, to settle up they're like oh i'm sorry you have this overdue uh tape uh showgirls apparently uh, you owe oh us this amount of money anyway i don't know what showgirls that, is uh jesse from uh say by the bell right yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, so dirty. <laughs> so anyway, I thought that was hilarious, but right. but that, that was, was the hijinks. That was the worst the career move ever. Okay, so no uh, Roland, does that one Roland the uh, topic pass or fail? All failed. What do you give it? That one kind of failed. That one I, failed. Like I had ones so, I knew were gonna fail that I didn't bring up. I was oh gonna be like, goodness. what do you guys look forward to in fall? No, Leah, <laughs> Leah. So what? you brought us three topics. Roland and you passed one of them somehow, but I the other, the other two failed. But I brought anyway. like seven. Look at my own. I, I failed some of the ones before we started. I, what else you no, got? We're out of time. I yeah. think that uh, I think that our audience deserves more of you. And you know what? I'd like to know what they have to say. So, no, but the audience quick, is good. They have me. That's all I need. Real quick, let's hit this week's <laughs> question of the week, Leah. What is it? Question of the week. <laughs> <laughs> she just looked so shocked and surprised. Do you remember? Blue Jays. Hey, uh, so producer of this podcast. Yeah. What's this week's question of the week? I like to like really just go Should've on the thought of this earlier, eh? Here's the question of the week. What is the first movie that you rented by yourself? 
Showgirls. No, it wasn't Showgirls for you, was it? Do you remember the first movie that you ever rented by yourself? Your own money? Rambo. You walked in and rented? Uh, yeah, it was probably Three Men and a Little Baby. <laughs> it was like my favorite movie. Again, my parents, there was like two movies we rented every Saturday, and my parents just didn't buy them. They just let us continue to rent them. I, like remember, I remember the movie that I rented, but I don't remember the name of it. And it had, uh, <laughs> this is going to be a long story now. It, oh who, who was the like Russian dude in Rocky V? Um, if Louis was here, you can answer it. Anyway, that guy was in another movie where he had to get in a fight with people and he drove a red car. I remember that movie. Do you remember the movie? Yeah, where he had like, he was just yeah, like, yeah. and he drove like a he red Ferrari a or something. Ram- Rambo, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was a, he was a, no, he was a bad guy in Rocky. Yeah, that's but right. in this other one, he played a good guy. Anyway, so the guy's name is, uh, is Dolph Ludgren. I don't remember the name of the movie, but he drove a red Ferrari. I remember that. Question of the week. What movie are we talking about? <laughs> good one. <laughs> good one. Anyway, with that, guys, I'd like to thank you, Roland. Thank you so much for your time and Leah for joining me. You're welcome. And Am producing the project is over already. What's that? Yeah. Am I wrapped? Are you wrapped? <laughs> anyway, guys, thanks so much for listening. We'll talk to you next time. Bye. Premiumbeat.com. Gotcha.